Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Tom Merritt and Leo Laporte. Episode 21, recorded August 24th, 2011. Kevin Mitnick. Triangulation is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, visit netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Triangulation. Welcome. Boy, I'm excited about this one. Tom Merritt, Leo Laporte. This is the show where we interview really interesting people about their really interesting lives and ideas. And we got somebody who has a really interesting life. Well, somebody we actually know fairly well. Uh, Kevin Mitnick is uh, the author of two uh, books about hacking, The Art of Deception and The Art of Intrusion, and has just written his first memoir, the story of his life called Ghost in the Wires. Now, if you don't know who Kevin Mitnick is, you might remember an episode of The Screensavers. Kevin uh, is a hacker who was caught, arrested, served a long time, much of it in solitary confinement in prison. When he got out of jail, there was a whole m movement to free Kevin. Uh, he came to visit us on The Screensavers. And, of course, as condition of his parole, he wasn't allowed to use the Internet for a fairly long period of time. And when we found out that the day was about to arrive, that Kevin was going to get to use the Internet for the first time, we invited him, Emmanuel Goldstein uh, of the Hacker Journal 2600, and Steve Wozniak, Kevin's friend, uh, to come by to the screensavers set. And we'll just roll a little bit of this uh, tape. This is Kevin Mitnick's first day back online. The reformed hacker who spent time in maximum security and made free Kevin a household term on his release from prison three years ago after serving a five-year sentence. Kevin was barred from using the Internet. That was the terms of his probation. For the first time in eight years, Kevin Mitnick is finally going to be allowed back online, and it's going to happen today. Welcome, Kevin. It's good to... Have you on the show? It's a it's a great to be Wish here. Wish my I'm publisher excited. had thought about something excited. like this to pl plug my book sales. Man, <laughs> perfect timing. Man, huh? <laughs> wow! I have it here. This is a letter from the United States District Court U.S. Probation Office. Somebody tore this open. I had to see what that I was. I think you were a little you know, excited a little worried, when this came. You know, what could it be? Let's just let's just uh, read it here. I'm going to cover up the phone number because uh, we don't want anybody to call him. But this is from Gregory, your probation officer. The purpose of this letter is to inform you that uh, as of January 20th, 2003, that's midnight this morning, right? Correct. correct. You exactly. will have successfully completed your of federal supervision. No idea what that means. I wish you the best of luck <laughs> in the future. That's nice. Very thoughtful. If I can be of any assistance, please feel free to contact me. And uh, you called him, right? Well, I called him this morning because I wanted to make absolutely sure. It's okay. There's no surprises. <laughs> now, tell me the truth. 1201, you got online. 1201, we were uh, having a party in the hotel room. You were celebrating? And I had, to, I had to get up very early this morning for a CNN. And we were in, it was like we stayed up to 1.30 and I had to get up at 4. Has this been something you've been looking forward to? Oh, yeah. of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been missing out. The internet is like kind of like having a telephone these days. It's so ambiguous that uh, to be without it, yeah. it's like... I couldn't use an electronic toilet without getting permission of the U.S. government. Right. They were afraid. Well, they were, I know. They were afraid. 11 years ago. Is that right? No, it's eight years ago. Kevin Mitnick got back on the Internet. He's actually done pretty well ever since. Kevin Mitnick, thanks for joining us. To hey, thank you for having me on your show, Leo. It's great to be back. It's great to see you. Kevin is, uh, we call him a reformed hacker because he's actually got a pretty good business uh, hacking for uh, the good guys, I guess. You're white hat now. I don't want to spoil a, a, an excellent part of what you did with the book, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a great pen testing section there uh, that, that I, I really enjoyed reading. Oh, in, 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 you're talking about it in the prologue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh. we kind of, I wanted to start out the book with like doing something that looks at present time uh, and then to tell the readers, hey, this was just a, a pen test, and then go back in time and go, you know, from the beginning of, you know, my career as, you know, a phone freaker and walk everybody through this uh, catch-me-if-you-can cat-and-mouse game that I had with the government for that lasted, I'd say, about two decades. 
Yeah, you were on the LAM for a long time. But let's go back to the beginning because you started in your technical career, and I didn't know this till I saw the book, as a ham radio operator. Exactly. When I was 13 years old, I uh, passed my general class license, and I was you know, fascinated with the ham radio. It actually started with CB radio, but at the time, you had to be 18 years or older to get a CB license. Yeah, but with a ham, all you had to do was pass, pass a test. So I, I studied up on Morse code, studied up on electronic theory, went down and got my license. Do you still uh, practice on the amateur airwaves? Not much. I haven't been on the air for a, a couple of years. Come up so. here. Come up here because we got a great, I, you know, I just got my license. we got a great ham station up here and we could put you on the air. We put you back on the internet. We could put you back on the airwaves. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Now, if I understand it right, you got into ham radio from uh, a uh, bus driver. Was that one of the bus drivers you were using your hacked transfers on? Yeah, exactly. You know, um, uh, I don't know. It was about, you know, 13, yeah, about four. No, how old was I? I was about 13 years old. And I was riding the bus, and uh, this driver told me he had found a radio on the bus, and he showed it to me, and it was a Motorola HT. He says, I think it's a police radio. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, that's cool. It'd be really cool to eavesdrop on the cops. And then he, then he told me he was pulling my leg and showed me all about ham radio. I immediately the next day went to the ham radio store to find out about how I could become a ham because what was cool, what he showed me, is the auto patch, how... With right. this little HT handheld, how we can make a phone call. And this was before cell phones. So to me, it was like super cool. You went to Henry Radio, which is, I think, still there in uh, West L.A. No, I uh, think they actually closed. No, they closed. Oh, they, they, yeah, they, they, I, I think, think they're still, cool they're still selling Henry. stuff. They still make stuff, I think. They make amplifiers and stuff. Yeah. I have I a Henry uh, interface box for my uh, phone. Uh, but you're right. That was the early days of ham, and I don't know if auto patch is around much anymore now that cell phones have taken over. Were you? Were you? It sounds like you were pretty devious from day one. When did, <laughs> did you always have the hacking urge? I don't know. I think it was like a naturally born hacker. I mean, I started with the bus system when I was 12. You punched your own out. transfers. Exactly. And how I did it is it was kind of like a social engineering thing. I I was looking at a transfer on the back of the bus. And the transfer is like you paid a fare and then you pay an extra dime at the time and you get this transfer where you could go onto a different you know, bus to wherever your destination is. And, uh, and as I was exiting the bus, well, you needed a special punch to punch the transfer. And as I was exiting the bus, you know, I'm a 12 year old kid. I go, hey, sir, uh, I'm doing this special project in school and we have to punch these weird shapes on cardboard and that punch you know, it has those weird shapes. Where do you buy one? And, you know, he goes, oh, kid, you know, we bought, you know, we buy it at the store. And I found out it was 15 bucks. I asked my mom for 15 bucks. Oh, man. I go down to the store. I purchase the punch. But the problem is, is you can't buy blank transfers. You know, they're not going to sell them to you. But as a 12-year-old, I was thinking, well, what do these guys do at the end of the day? They're not going to sit there and clean their bus. Some maintenance guy is probably going to sweep everything to a pile, throw it into a dumpster. So I rode my bike from my grandmother's house over to the bus depot, and I didn't even have to trespass. I rode right into the uh, right up to the dumpster. I pulled myself over, and jackpot! You know, there's all these uh, discarded books of transfers, and um, and at the time, you know, my fa family and people that knew about what I was doing, they were actually giving me a lot of attaboys. They thought it was hilarious. Even uh, the bus drivers, apparently, right? Even the bus drivers would knew what I was doing. And then when I was waiting for a bus as a kid, I. I'd, I'd ask the people waiting, hey, do you want to ride for free? I could punch you a transfer. <laughs> so I was like, uh, and that was like, you know, starting at 12 years old before I was introduced to ham radio. And then when I was in high school, I met this kid that could just do magic with the telephone. And he was a phone freaker. And this was kind of my, you know, foot in the door into doing these technology types, ha type hacks was phone freaking. And he showed me how he, uh, how he could call a secret number at the phone company called the CNA Bureau, and he can give the lady a telephone number. They didn't even ask him who he was, and she would give them give the name and address that's associated with that number, even if it was non-published. He, he showed me loop around lines. You call on one, uh, one number, you have a friend call on, on another, and it's a telephone company test circuit, and you're automatically joined together. And it was all these tricks he could do with the phone, and I kind of fell in love with it. I go, this is so damn cool. 
Um, and I just wanted to learn more. And then, you know, I started pulling pranks with the phone system because I was a prankster at the time and I was manipulating the telephone system to pull pranks on friends. You know, because it strikes me, you didn't, the bus transfer thing, you really weren't getting ahead. 15 bucks, that's 150 transfers you could have bought. You, <laughs> it wasn't to save money, really. It was it, kind of like to beat the system. It was to beat, so this really, yeah. the motivation here, and I think that's really critical to understanding you, is to understand that it wasn't, you weren't trying to steal anything. You were interested in the systems themselves. Yeah, I was trying to always find flaws with the system and trying to manipulate it uh, for fun. It wasn't really for profit. Um, and uh, when I was doing this as a kid, you would think that your parents or your teachers or even the bus drivers that knew what I was doing would say, hey, you know, this is wrong. You know, you shouldn't be doing this. And instead, I had bus drivers that would give me a blank book of transfers because they thought it was cute. Right. You, you know, get away so with a lot when you're young and cute. It changes as you get older. <laughs> Obviously, even, yeah. Even when I started getting involved in hacking, you know, when I was in high school, um, the, the ethics taught during that time was that hacking was cool. It was encouraged by your teachers huh. and, and family, and there was not even laws against it. There was no computer crime laws on the books when I started. Wow. Yeah. Did you have a mentor? Not in uh, hacking. In, in phone freaking, there was a kid I met in high school that kind of was like the magician. He showed me the magic tricks he could do with the phone, but wouldn't tell me the secrets, so I had to work them out on my own. Well, I thought it was really interesting in the book how you talked about the survival bookstore. We, we don't really have those anymore. They used to be more common. Now you could just kind of go on the Internet. But back then you actually had to go and, and find nooks and crannies and places that would vend this kind of information. Oh, yeah, like the survival bookstore in North Hollywood. They, they sold all the underground books by Paladine Press and Eden Press. And it was, you know, how to uh, pick a lock, you know, how to build a bug, how to detect a bug how to create an identity in America and disappear forever. Oh, yeah. That was the... all, this, all this underground information to me was fascinating because it was the forbidden knowledge, the information that no one wanted you to know. And, of course, I wanted to learn it all. And that's the appeal of things like the Anarchist Cookbook. It's not because you want to go be an anarchist. It's like, oh, my God, there's all this strange information in here that nobody else will tell me. Exactly. And uh, I remember I used one of those books to get a – I was – 13 years old, I mailed away for a fake ID from Eden Press. Oh, man. Yeah, that said I was 18 years old. That way I could buy lock picks in the survival bookstore. So I remember going to the counter with my fake ID. Hello, I'd like to buy a lock pick. I'm 18. Really? <laughs> and the lady laughed, right? But she knew. She goes, all right, Kevin, I'll sell you these lock picks. But, uh, you know, don't get into trouble. And she knew. I wasn't 18, but she still sold them to me anyway. Hey, she was in compliance. At one point, uh, General Telephone, the head of security for General Telephone, actually visited your house and told you and your mom they were gonna they were gonna terminate your phone service. Yeah, um, they were tired of my phone freaking games after a while, and uh, a guy named Don Moody, who was the head of security for General Telephone. Uh, told my my mom they were they were going to remove the phone service and they weren't kidding, and they terminated it. And my of course my my mother was very upset with me. Um, so what I did is I said, "Mom, don't worry, I'll fix it." <laughs> so I called the provisioning department of General Telephone and I told them this condominium complex is having a new unit provisioned. And a couple days later, I call up and I order telephone service for Unit 12B. We were living in Unit 13. There was no Unit 12B. So I went to the hardware store, and I, you know, I purchased a 1, a 2, and a B, took down the 13, <laughs> I put 12B up on the door. The phone guy installs the phone service, and the phone company didn't figure it out for about three weeks. But I think how they figured it out is I got the telephone in the name of James Bond, and the last three digits were 007. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they probably set off some sort of red flag. And then they, you know, then they finally turned it off after a few weeks. Well, and I think that's one of the things that separates you. From, I've heard a lot of stories of people who've gotten in trouble uh, for, you know, doing war dialing or, 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 you know, doing some kind of phone freaking. And they get that visit 
like you got, and then that ends it for them. But your response was, well, this is another interesting tweak in the system. How can I get around this? Exactly. I remember when the FBI visited, uh, visited our house, I think I was like 16 years old. I was upstairs in my bedroom hacking into a telephone switch at, at the same time, but they were visiting for another reason. Apparently somebody hacked into MIT and they had a report it was me when it really wasn't. So the agent was downstairs talking to me about this. And uh, as soon as he left, I went back upstairs and started hacking the switch again. You know, it didn't phase me. Uh, you know, I was kind of incorrigible as a kid. So, and there were no laws against it. I mean, even the FBI agent said, you know, you know, soon, Kevin, there's going to be laws against this computer stuff, and you, and you can go to jail for 25 years. I remember him telling me this. You know? Even though it wasn't really true. I mean, there weren't laws at that point. No, there wasn't. Yeah, there, it wasn't until, like, 1984. Yeah. And were you ever scared? You, you, were you never, like, put off? Like, oh, I better, I better back off. I better stop this. Uh, at times, I'd get scared, and I'd stop for a short period of time. And then because hacking, to me, was all about the endorphin rush, mm -hmm. the intellectual challenge, the seduction of adventure, and especially the pursuit of knowledge. And these drivers were so great that, and it was what I, so I loved to do. I had such a passion with it that I kept going back. The temptation was just too great. You, were you addicted? I don't know if I was addicted or obsessed or, mm. or, what the, or, or just extremely passionate. I just loved it and didn't want to stop. So you, you dropped out of high school. Yeah, I took the test. I, I you got the GED. I, I, I took the GED. I walked out of high school. And this is, um, it's an interesting story because when I was in high school, I tried to sign up for computer science class and the instructor uh, said that I didn't have the prerequisites because you needed calculus, you needed uh, different prereqs, physics, calculus, and the whole list of them. And at the time, you know, computer science was, you know, something very new. So it, you'd have to be, like, you know, you'd have to have all these requirements. And so my friend who suggested I take, uh, take the class uh, was there when, and he introduced me to the instructor and I showed him all these cool things I could do with the phone system and with ham radio. And he actually waived the requirements and let me into class. Wow. And I think he regrets it to this day because all I did was drive this guy crazy. <laughs> um, so I this remember, was the transition from phone freaking to computer freak hacking. Well, it was kind of like, my first assignment was to write a program in Fortran to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers. Instead, I wrote a login simulator that <laughs> stole uh, student passwords because I thought that was much more entertaining. And I didn't get to finish the Fibonacci assignment because I was too busy working on my login simulator. And at the end of the day, the teacher gave me an A and showed the class the cool program I wrote. So at the time, the ethics taught in school was hacking was cool. Right. Yeah, well, and I, hacking different than the malicious cracking and, and, and that kind of definition. There wasn't any separation. It was all just hacking. It was all playing oh, around yeah. with computers. Yeah. yeah, and hacking was, you know, was a lot different than it is today. You know, you're not going after credit card accounts or bank accounts or writing malware. It was more, I think it was a lot more benign. It was more, you know, they had the uh, ethic of not doing it for money and not doing it to harm anybody. Right. It was... Uh, really about the challenge and uh, pursuit of knowledge. And I'm sure there's hackers today that still do it for those reasons, but I think the trend has definitely changed. Did you worry though that, I mean, you, you, you might be hurting people at any point? I mean, or do you feel like you never did anything to, to hurt people? Well, I never intentionally try to harm anybody. I played games with people, practical jokes, like one of my favorites was to change my, my friend's home telephones to a payphone. So whenever <laughs> they tried to make a call from home, it would say, please deposit a quarter. <laughs> um, so I used to do like th this type of crazy stuff. But when I was hacking into companies, I never really figured I was causing them any damage because I knew my intent wasn't to harm them. I really wanted to look at the source code to operating systems so I could become better at getting around security. You because weren't going I, in trying to delete things or wipe out things. No, no, never. Of course, I put in back doors so I can get back into the system. I looked at source code so I could find out new ways of hacking into the, into the particular operating system. But it was never about harming anybody or, or, or making money. Um, that was simply something to me that would, would be criminal. But, of course, companies don't 
take too kindly even to backdoors and, and you oh, poking no, around at their source code. So. Certainly I broke the law. I broke the law, but my intent mm -hmm. uh, at the time wasn't to cause harm. What so, was it oh, that you finally, finally got busted for? I'm sorry? What was it that you finally got busted for? Oh, computer hat. Well, wire fraud, computer fraud, possession of access devices. The wire fraud was hacking into computers. The computer fraud was hacking into computers. The, the possession of access devices was uh, having passwords uh, that I was able to intercept on the wire. It was primarily just all these federal offenses that they could, you know, kind of throw on to cover all the hacking activities. So, so it wasn't one in individual hack. It was a, it was a long lifetime well, career. A pattern <laughs> of being a bad boy. Yeah. You know, and what really got the federal government, I think, upset with me is when I was starting to do counterintelligence on the FBI. <laughs> and uh, when they were investigating me, there was an informant uh, that was kind of, uh, I guess, sent by the FBI either to entrap me or to find out what I was doing. So I started investigating this informant. And so I wanted to learn more about this guy. Uh, he went by the name Eric Hines. So I hacked into Pactel Cellular, which was the one of the, the wireline cell phone company in Los Angeles. And I did a terminating number search. In other words, I once I got into their network, I looked for anybody that called the informant and then I was able to identify a bunch of FBI cell phones. And so I figured those people that were in communication with the informant were also the same people that were trying to nail me. So what I did is I actually took the, this uh, list of FBI cell phone numbers and I programmed them into a system at a, at a private investigation company that I was working at at the time. Uh, and so you had a computer, you had the scanner that was monitoring the data channel of the cell site, and you had this box called the DDI. And with this contraption, anytime a cell phone number that I was looking for would register at the cell site, it would actually send me an alert. So what I uh, essentially did was set up an early warning system for the FBI. So one day I walked into my office and I heard this beeping sound. I thought it was the alarm, but I soon learned as I walked closer to my office, the sound was getting louder. And all of a sudden I walk into my office and I look at my computer and the FBI phone, one of them that I was tracking was in the area. And around two hours earlier, it called a pay phone number that was across the street from my apartment. So I was thinking, I was going, well, they couldn't be there to arrest me because I was home sleeping at 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. and they're probably not following me. So I thought maybe they're going to get a search warrant because when they get a search warrant, they have to go out to the uh, home that they're going to search and they have to write the precise description. It's like a Fourth Amendment requirement. So immediately that evening, I go home, I clean out anything related to computers, no floppy disks, no computers, no notes, anything. And then I went and went to Winchell's Donuts I got an assorted dozen of uh, donuts, and I, with a big marker, I wrote FBI donuts <laughs> and I put it in the refrigerator. And the next day, 6 a.m., federal agents show up. They, they're, they're in there searching my apartment. I asked if I could leave uh, because I wasn't under arrest. They told me I wasn't under arrest. And then I left. I went to my father's house, and when I returned, I immediately looked in the refrigerator for the donuts, and they were all there. They didn't have any. I guess they, they didn't want any of the FBI donuts that left for them. <laughs> Impeccable ethics. They did not eat the <laughs> FBI donuts. Well, I'm them. sure there was a moment when they went, God, those are good. <laughs> so so I, I pissed them off. You know, yeah. I, you know, so when they finally caught up with me, uh, well, caught up with me years later, well, they were pretty angry because of all the, the games I was playing with you them. So tweaked, they kind of you had tweaked it. them. You had yeah, you pulled on the tiger's tail. Well, And you got to figure, there's I'll people in, 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 watching yeah. this right now who are like, Kevin... <laughs> it's the FBI. Why, why don't you run, hide, change your identity? Do you know you've got all these skills? Well, why do you, why oh, do you buy did. them? Donuts? Are you kidding? You were the greatest fugitive ever. How long were you on the run? Uh, for about three years. Three years evading the FBI. Yeah, I was working for a law firm. It was quite interesting because I was working for this uh, law firm, Home Roberts and Owen, in Denver, Colorado, as an IT specialist, and the law firm. Uh, had, I believe, as partners, some retired federal judges. So here I was working in a law firm, you know, with, uh, you know, with retired federal judges. And in my spare time, I'd go to their law library and try to figure out a loophole where I can get out of the mess I was getting, you know, that I got myself into. 
Did you continue hacking during this through these three years oh, on the road? Yeah. Like during the day, I'd work legitimate jobs, and because I was bored, I couldn't talk to family or friends, you know, without risk. Even though I did call family and friends occasionally. So what I used to do to occupy my time is I'd work during the day and I'd hack at night. And this is when I wanted to create invisibility is what I targeted at that time was the cell phone companies that manufactured cellular phones like Motorola and Nokia. And what my goal was, was to get the source code to the phone so I could modify the firmware in my phone to be, to create invisibility because uh. I, from tracking the FBI, how easy it is to track a target through the cell phone system I wanted to be able to become untrackable. So I hacked into these companies to leverage invisibility. And then it got to be such a challenge and so interesting to me that I started hacking into other cellular phone company manufacturers to get the source code as a trophy. And as soon as I got the trophy, I would just move on to the next. You always liked source code. I mean, I think one of your early hacks was uh, hacking deck for the VMS source code. Exactly, and that was to become a better hacker. Right. Because if I can get access to the source code, I could look at the developer comments. I could look at you know of, of security vulnerabilities that they had fixed. I could try to identify new security vulnerabilities, and if I wanted to, I could play some you know covert code in the source, recompile it, and stick it on a system that I wanted to get back into. You now, like a backdoor, uh, like for an example, like a backdoor. So I was leveraging the source code to become a better hacker. It wasn't like leveraging the source code to go sell it to somebody. It's no, no, it. yeah, it's curiosity. Yeah. And exactly. you had a benefit. Well, curiosity yeah. killed the cat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you're on the run, did you uh, did you feel like it enhanced that 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 rush of of going after uh, different prizes, different achievements like that, or or did it get in the way? Did you wish that you didn't have to to hide? No, I treated it actually as an adventure, and I kind of psychologically put myself in a mindset that I was like working an undercover operation as a private investigator and you know working under a different identity so because i had solid government identity i had a, a legitimate job uh i didn't feel uncomfortable now when i contacted you know my family or my friends this is when i had additional security and how i created the security is i'd always hack into the local phone company and access their switching equipment and modify the software in their switch so my calls couldn't be easily traced and so anytime I moved to a new city, I would always compromise the local uh, telephony infrastructure to create that invisibility. Um, and I remember I had my cover identity down so well that if I was walking in a supermarket and somebody said, Kevin, I, I would hear it, but I wouldn't react. I wouldn't turn around. But if they said Eric, because at the time I was under the name Eric Weiss, people always want to know, like, why did you choose Eric Weiss? Well, because that is the real name for my idol at the time, Harry Houdini. Ah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's great. So, of course, I had a sense of humor. The FBI did not, but <laughs> story. but I mean, that's how, that's what I did, is I put myself in the, uh, the, the mindset that I'm not a fugitive, mm -hmm. that I'm working as a private investigator, and that is how I was able to psychologically deal with these uncomfortable circumstances without looking over my shoulder. It was that phony Eric Weiss persona though that forced you to leave Denver you got well no I know actually I got fired from the law firm because my co-worker there um, was consulting on firm time and during the breaks and mind you this is when cell phone time was a dollar a minute right at least during the every time I'd go to lunch or I was on break I'd always be talking on my cell phone so the supervisor uh, or our supervisor at the time uh, just made a guess. Oh, Kevin, well, I'm sorry, Eric must be consulting as well because he's always on his phone. And of course, he's spending a lot of money on, you know, talking to somebody. So when they fired the other guy for consulting, they actually fired me at the same time. Of course, I wasn't consulting, but I was doing everything else. You probably weren't spending any money either, were you? <laughs> Free calls. No, uh, no of course. I yeah. was uh, cloning the phones. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't paying for the phone. So how did you ultimately, how did you get caught? Did you screw up? I did, I did screw up. I, um, uh, there, was a, uh, there was another fellow in, in Israel, uh, Jonathan, who went under the initials JSZ, and uh, we hacked into Shimomura's, uh, a guy named Satomo Shimomura's uh, workstation 
at UCSD. Actually, it was the second time. The first time I did it on my own, that's kind of a revelation in the book because nobody knew this. And the second time, JSZ did it. And what, you know, and it really pissed off Shima Mora, Shima Mora, rightly so. So he became like a cyber vigilante and he teamed up with the FBI. You pissed and off a, basically a guy who had hacking skills almost equal to your own. Well, I don't, I don't know his skill set. I really respected his skills because uh, one of the reasons I targeted him is because he was finding security vulnerabilities in Sun SunOS, which was an operating mm -hmm. system developed by Sun. And he was also working on reverse engineering the Oki 900 cell phone software with a guy named Mark Lauder. So this is what attracted to, uh, me to Shimomura as a target. And what happened is he, he was attacked, it made all this big news. Uh, his buddy, uh, John Markoff, wrote about it on the front page of the New York Times. So at the time, I just happened to relocate to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I knew how the federal government operated. I know they operated slowly. That, uh, that, and since I just moved there, and I was there such a short time, I was very lax with my security requirements. Mm -hmm. And, and because, of my, uh, because I was lax and because the government uh, operated so quickly and I misestimated the time is how they were able to go out and find the cell phone number I was using. I actually go out with radio direction finding gear and track the signal to my apartment. Hmm. And when the FBI came and knocked on my door, of course it was a surprise to me, but I figured I had nothing to lose. So I put on an act that I wasn't Kevin Mitnick. The first thing they knocked on the door, they go, I go, who is it? They go, FBI. I go, what do you want? And they go, are you Kevin Mitnick? I go, no, I, I, you must have the wrong apartment. Go check out the mailboxes. And then they went away for like 10 or 15 minutes. And I go, oh my God, maybe it worked. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, 15 minutes later, they're knocking on the door again and they're not going away. And finally I, I, I cracked the door open and about, you know, six guys forced their way into my studio apartment and they started searching and I go, do you have a search warrant? And they go, well, if you're Kevin Mitnick, we, we have an arrest warrant. I said, I already told you I'm not this Mitnick guy. And here I show you, I show, I showed him my driver's license under my mm -hmm. uh, identity. And, and for a long time there, I'd say for a, a couple hours passed and they were searching. I was demanding they get a search warrant and I was acting very agitated that they were violating my rights. And they actually handed me a wanted poster of myself <laughs> and I look completely different. And they handed it to me and go, doesn't this look like you? And I go, I looked at it. I studied it for like 30 seconds in the back of my mind. I'm thinking maybe I can get out of this. And I handed it back and said, no, that doesn't look like me at all. Look like, <laughs> doesn't look like me at all. And, uh, and it took, you know, another hour, about an hour and a half before they found a pay stub issued to Kevin Mitnick that was in an old ski jacket uh -huh. I accidentally left in a pocket. Um, and there was a reason for it. And, and if you read Ghost in the Wires, you'll understand why that pay stub was accidentally left there because I had a escape from Seattle, uh, you know, a few weeks before. And uh, they found the pay stub and they arrested me. So that's how it actually went down. But I wasn't able to give you the full, you know, story because, you know, there's just so much to tell. Yeah. I mean, the book is the book is 400 pages, so it's really hard to cover it in you know in the short time we have here. What I love is that uh, you talk in uh, great technical detail about your hacks. So a lot of our audience uh, will love this book because um, I mean, if you like uh, BSD one-liners, uh, this is full of. <laughs> You, well, it's still accessible, I, even if you don't, but it's a that. nice treat. No, yeah, but I love it when you call Ginger. I think Ginger was having trouble with her computer in the law office, and you said, well, type this in uh, to help yeah. her out. And it yeah. was it's a short one-liner. I'll see if I can find it. And it just gives you a back door into her computer. <laughs> well, in fact, well, I actually set up that system. That was the gateway for the Internet for the law firm. And before I was employed at the law firm, they didn't have Internet, and they actually had me set it up for them. And that was the gateway computer. And what I needed to do was get back into the law firm after I left there to delete uh, source code off my computer, you know, evidence of my right. hacking right. At, on the law firm's computer. So I, uh, so I called this uh, girl, Ginger, who was my coworker, and I had her type a command. And what the command did was basically allowed me to connect to the computer and I had instant root access. <laughs> and uh, then, then I was able to get into another system inside the law firm and then from that I was able to work my way to my workstation and then I removed any of the files that were my personal files that obviously I didn't want anyone to see.
nc-l-p53-e slash bin slash sh ampersand. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't know. I wouldn't have known. She was, oh, yeah, whatever, Kevin. Or, I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> Anything, Eric, uh, Eric, she didn't know Kevin. Yeah. Anything yeah. you want, Eric. She's not happy with Kevin. <laughs> But, no, have you heard, by the way, have you heard back from, after, now that the, the, the Ghost in the Wires is out, have you heard back from people like Ginger and others? And No, and in the book, it's all real names and telephone numbers. You know, everything in there. I mean, there's probably a few names I don't recall that I had to use pseudonyms, but 99% of the book is real names and real, wow. and real phone numbers that I remembered. Google but, would be pleased. What? Google would be pleased. They like real names. Yeah. Do yeah. you think they're pissed? Uh, these people are pissed off at you? I hope not. It's been it's 20 years. It's a long time now. Well, Sean Nunley, who is the guy that I called at, at Novell after I was already into their network to get another access point through their dial-up modem pool in San Jose, um, and I, I kind of tricked him over the phone to set me up an account on one of their dial-up terminal servers. He and I are like great friends today. That's great. And I'm even friends with his supervisor that was his supervisor at Novell, and we're able to look back at all these hacking antics in the mid 1990s and actually laugh about them. Well, so, and, and in the in the book, you have a lot of examples of, of where hacking has nothing to do with technical prowess in a lot of cases. Well, it you has, wrote a whole book on social engineering. Yeah, and, and it has to do with that sort of social engineering that that you've talked about before. And there's there's great examples of that. I liked the example earlier in the book, though, when you talked about how you just sort of naturally seem to imitate people or take on characteristics that you think will endear you to them or make them more receptive to what you say. I mean, that, that has great, served you actor. throughout. I think Kevin's a great actor. That's what I think. Uh, maybe I should audition. You should have been an actor, Kevin. Because you're very sincere. No, I think, and I can see it even when you reenact these moments, you, you're very sincere and believable. That's the key, I guess, huh? Thank you. Maybe, maybe, I go to, maybe I should go to acting school. No, but... Um, or teach. Uh, I don't think... Yeah, teach. The, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 once, you were, once you were caught, um, it, it, some, some said, and I, I think this is probably true, this was for the feds, uh, the first test of these new uh, anti-hacking laws, and they really threw the book at you. At one point, Law enforcement officials convinced a judge you had the ability to start a nuclear war by whistling into a payphone. I mean, well, we no, actually, what happened is when I was busted for uh, hacking digital and getting a copy of their VMS source code, and the reason I was caught is the guy that was doing it with me, we had a falling out, and he called Deck and basically ratted me out. And uh, what happened is I thought they arrested me on a Friday. And I was expecting to get out on Monday because in America, you figure, you know, you can get bail. It's just the amount. And um, I go to court. My family's there. At the time I was married, my wife was there. And the prosecutor tells the judge, <laughs> not only do we have to detain Mr. Mitnick as a national security threat, but we have to make sure he can't get to a telephone in the prison. And then he went on and said, the reason we don't want him to get near a telephone is he could pick up the phone, dial up to NORAD, whistle into the phone, and possibly launch a nuclear weapon. And when, when he said this, I started laughing in court because, first of all, of course it's absurd. Yeah. Second, the guy's burning his trust and credibility with the court. But unfortunately, the judge bought it hook, line, and sinker, and I was actually detained, and I was held in the hole in solitary confinement for about eight months. But that didn't stop me from hacking from the hole. I still ha! figured a way to beat the system. What? No, you were hacking from solitary confinement? Yeah, you want to, you want to hear the story? Yeah. Well, I was under this uh, phone restriction. I wasn't allowed to dial uh, the telephone. It had to be a guard. So what they would do is anytime I'd make a phone call, they would actually handcuff me, shackle your legs because you're in ultra high security. They'd walk me like 30 feet to a room that had a bank of pay phones you know, on the wall, and they'd unshackle me. The guard would uh, would open a logbook. He'd ask me who I, who I wanted to call. I was only allowed to call five people. And uh, he would dial the number, you know, zero plus the number. It'd have to be a collect call. And then he would, he would sit down in a chair three to four feet away from me and not take his eyes off me. So in prison, the handset cord is a little bit longer. So I was able, like, to pace back and forth as I was talking on the phone. And my wife at the time 
uh, during the day when they allowed me to use the phone would be at work and her work number wasn't on the list and she worked at General Telephone oh. and General Telephone always took a collect calls. So what I did is as I was walking back and forth, I'd be scratching my back, I'd be rubbing my payphone, uh, rubbing my back against the payphone. And then at one point I figured I'd give it a shot. I happened to be ending a call with my mom, but when we ended the call, I was still acting like I was talking to her. And as I was rubbing my back against the phone, I would reach behind my back and I'd hold down the switch hook for like two seconds and the guy would be looking at me in the eye and I'd continue like I'm still talking and I'd move my hand to the front because I knew once I had dial tone, I had 18 seconds before you'd hear a reorder, like beep, 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 mm-hmm. beep, beep, right? So I had 18 seconds, so I you know, rub my back against the payphone again, <laughs> I'd reach behind and I'd be able to dial zero plus the number you know, behind my back. You know, I'm an experienced phone freak. <laughs> so I dialed the number and then I would have to time it. You know, then I'd say, well, okay, mom, I'll talk to you later. Tell Uncle Harry that Kevin says hello. And when I said Kevin, that's when the operator is asking me who the clock calls from. So I was able to call anybody I wanted right under the guard's nose. And that lasted for about two and a half weeks. <laughs> and then one morning, my door of my cell opened and it was the prison executives, like the associate warden, the captain, you know, people that were there, when they come to speak with you, it's about something pretty serious. Yeah. So they escort me to the attorney client room, again in handcuffs. They sit me down and they go, Mitnick, how you doing it? I go, how am I doing what? How are you redialing the phone? <laughs> I go, I don't know what you're talking about. They go, we're monitoring all the calls, all the inmate calls downstairs and you're somehow redialing the phone in front of our officer. <laughs> and I go, guys, I'm not David Copperfield. I don't know what you're talking about. No, you're and Eric Weiss. Course, yeah, right. I was a wise ass. You know, they, they put me back. You know, what are they, I'm in solitary confinement in a federal prison. What are they going to do to you? Getting out. <laughs> it what can't get I, any worse. You no, know, what, 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 what can they do to me, right? right? So two days later, uh, Pacific Bell is out installing a phone jack in the corridor where my cell was. And I'm thinking to myself, are these morons actually going to install a phone in my cell and try to restrict it to five numbers? No, that was my thought at the time. Right. And when I had to make a phone call, what happened is they brought a phone, uh, they plugged it into the wall, they dialed the number that I was authorized to dial, and then they would feed the handset on a 25-foot cord through the trap door of the cell. So the only thing I could hold was the phone handset. I couldn't uh, get to the got you. Bad. So I, you know, it was kind of like, it felt like Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. You so, eight months in solitary, four and a half years pre-trial. You yeah, just, you, you, you were in jail. In fact, longer than I can think of any anybody before you even went to trial. I mean, they really were taking exactly. you as a serious threat. And that's why they had the free Kevin movement is because to hold somebody without trial, they wouldn't let my lawyer look at the evidence. They found encrypted files on my computer, and the judge said, "Well, unless you give us the password, we're not going to let your lawyer have access to it." And there was this big year fight over allowing me to use a laptop in federal prison to show my lawyer what the evidence was because my lawyer wasn't technically astute. He was an attorney. So, uh, and because of all this back and forth and delays, I sat there for four and a half years. And then, and then I wanted to go to trial and it wasn't to say, hey, I wasn't the hacker. I wanted to admit to hacking, but there was a law uh, or a recent case where a guy was convicted of computer hacking but it was just for the curiosity and the federal appellate court reversed his convictions hmm. because they said you can't commit computer fraud or wire fraud if the object is just curiosity so i wanted to go to trial and what my attorney told me is one of the prosecutors had told him if i take this to trial what they're going to do is they're going to hold me without bond and if they lose they're just going to put me on the bus meaning they're going to put bus me to a different federal jurisdiction and keep trying me over and over again to either I'm convicted or they keep me detained without bail for such a long time that I'm gonna lose anyway. So what I did is I ended up signing a deal to get out of federal prison. Um, I signed a five-year deal. And at first they wanted to restrict where I couldn't tell my life story for my, for my entire life, just like they did with Kevin Polson. And uh, I, went, I went to agree to it. I said, then we're going to trial. So then we settled on seven years. So I wasn't allowed to really tell the full details of my story or write about it or profit from it 
for about a period of seven years uh, from my release, which expired in 2007. Is that when you began work on uh, Ghost in the Wires? No, actually, my publisher was trying to pitch it to, uh, I'm sorry, my agent was trying to pitch it to several publishers. And since they already writ written three books about me mm -hmm. and did a motion picture about me, they go, well, there's nothing new about this case. It's not going to be interesting because we already know the story. What the publishers didn't know is they had no idea uh, what the real story was. And then finally, Little Brown commissioned, uh, commissioned uh, myself and Bill Simon to write the book. And uh, it's uh, doing it. It's amazing. I mean, everyone that's re read, uh, that has read the book loves it. I have puzzles in there. So there's cryptograms. Not, yeah, yeah, I noticed those. At yeah, the beginning of each chapter. Oh, this is chapter. a challenge now. Let's see. And I want to ask you, Leo, is if you solve all the cryptograms, yeah. and what happens is you get a, a list of 20 questions. And if you solve those 20 questions, if you read the book, you could easily solve them. Then I consider that you won. And what I would like to do, I can't run this as a legal contest, so I can't promise it. But what I want to do is throw all these names into a hat of people that solved the cryptograms and then draw out 10 names. And then the FBI has returned all the evidence that they seized for me in my cases. And I just want to give the evidence out as memorabilia. Oh, that's great. And, and the evidence is really cool. Could I leave the screen for a second? I'll show one to yeah, you. Yeah, I'd love to see it. One so second. are these just simple uh, substitution ciphers uh, in every case? Do you think I'm going to tell you how to crack the code? <laughs> They Are look like substitution You can't social engineer a social engineer. <laughs> they, they look Hold like on, it. it for you one All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the book, if you're looking for it, and, uh, you know, somebody already in our chat room halfway into the interview said, I bought this book. I've, I'm ordering it. Coast, it, you know, it's true. You may have uh, read Markov's book or Littman's book. Uh, you may have seen the movie. Uh, I have done all the three, and this is not the same story. This is the real story. There's a whole lot more to the it's story. It's very, yeah. very different. And it's also how somebody becomes uh, uh, Kevin Mitnick. Uh, Ghost in the Wires is the name of it. Little Brown is the uh, publisher, and it's out now. Um, and I don't know. I should check it. But I bet you there's Kindle uh, versions. I wonder if there's an Audible version. That would be awesome. There's the uh, there's the uh, uh, Amazon uh, listing for it, and it looks like they do have yeah, audio. So that's is. fantastic. They do have an Audible version of that. That's fantastic. Uh, so I guess I'll be putting that on my Audible Audible list. I should get Kevin to read that. Hey, this show brought to you by, as long as Kevin's looking for some memorabilia, Netflix.com. If you are not yet a Netflix subscriber, quick run to Netflix.com slash twit. Sign up uh, for Netflix. Uh, you don't have to be in solitary confinement to enjoy <laughs> Netflix uh, on your Xbox, your PlayStation 3, uh, your Nintendo Wii, most Blu-ray players, many TVs these days, certainly your iPad, iPhone, Android phones, uh, some great movies on Netflix. I'm a big fan, and the best part is the $7.99 a month for unlimited movies and TV shows streaming to your device. It is the best deal in entertainment. If you're already a Netflix member, try it out and tell your friends. Netflix.com slash twit. <coughs> Excuse me. Ne Kevin, you've, you've got some memorabilia for us. Yeah, so if you could see this in my Skype, uh, this is like an FBI evidence bag. Yeah. And there's a battery pack to the Novotel cell phone. That's still sealed in the bag. I have a whole bunch of these things from you know, oh, the mouses I used, and like here's some battery packs for some ham radio stuff in FBI evidence bag, sealed. And so I have no need for this evidence. So I thought it would be cool is why not give these out to people that have solved, you know, to you know, to a group of people that have solved the uh, the puzzles. Um, and I, I just thought it would be cool. I even have uh, um, the cell phone. This is the cell phone I use. It's a Novatel PTR-825. Wow, I hacked the firmware so I could actually change the ESN from the keypad. And this phone actually has the invisibility feature uh, programmed in. So if I put in a certain uh, uh, a code, what happens is it disables registration and basically disables tracking of my cell phone. Of course, these don't work anymore yeah. because they're called AMP system. But this was uh, the Novatel. And of course, if you look on the back, you have the uh, FBI... Uh, Seattle Police Department. The Seattle there. Police, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, that's cool. I'd love to have a little bit of that for if you get if you have an extra piece or two for the uh, studio. Yeah, I, next, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to send it to next you. Next time you come up here, well, you got to come up and visit us. I know, and one of my favorite, actually, one of my favorite hacks of all time wasn't into like Digital Equipment Corporation or into a phone company. It was actually into McDonald's. Is this the goofy hack you were going to tell me about? 
Yeah, this is the funny one. All right, and let's it, see. The funniest hack Kevin ever did. Yeah, I, I believe it's the, the best one is, remember we talked earlier on the show that I was an avid ham, a ham radio operator. Right. So I modified my ham radio to go out of band so I could transmit and receive outside the amateur radio band. And I found the frequency to McDonald's drive up windows. Oh, dear. So This is I, worthy of Wozniak, I think. I'm sorry? This is worthy of Woz. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think Woz has done this one. And so what, would, what I could do is I could sit up to a quarter mile away and I could overtake the drive, uh, basically hijack the drive up window. So the guy inside the McDonald's with his headset could hear everything that's going on, but can't stop it. So what I used to do is just take over the drive up window and a, per a person would drive up. I take their order. I say, oh, you're the 50th uh, customer today. Please drive forward. Your order's for free. Um, <laughs> cops would drive up. And before I take the order, I'd say, hide the cocaine, hide the cocaine, hide the cocaine. Oh, okay. <laughs> To the point, I'm a bad man, Kevin. <laughs> to the point where the the poor manager leaves the store. He's in the parking lot, looking into every vehicle. Who is messing with our store? He doesn't see anyone, and then he actually he actually walks up to the speaker for the drive up window, and he puts his face in it like he's going to see the Chucky. <laughs> Is there anyone in there? I press down my mic and I go, what the hell are you looking at? And the guy <laughs> flies back 10 to 15 feet, you know, shocked. And I mean, this, I, I, I guess this just tops it as the best hack of all time of Kevin Mitnick. Oh, Kevin, it's, you know, I'm, I'm just glad you're not in jail anymore, that you're working very successfully uh, as a security expert. And if any company wants the best security expert ever, you're the guy. Uh, I know you hack in the companies for a, a living now, at their behest. And, yes, uh, that's fact, a great way to take your take your little twist and make it. Uh, a right, you still get to satisfy. <laughs> Does it still feel satisfactory when you when you go and you do that penetration testing? And oh, oh, absolutely. It still I love scratches it. that itch. I, I still love it. I mean, uh, I'm hacking every day. The only difference is I do it with authorization. I'm getting paid for it. I'm providing a service. It's almost like it's not work. And I still get that endorphin rush. You know, it's like when I finally figured a way in, it's so cool. And I'm not going to get into trouble. And I'm, you know, it, it, it's just where could you take a criminal activity right. and make it legal where it, it benefits everybody around? I mean, I'm so lucky and so fortunate that my life has turned around the way it has because I never would have predicted when I was, you know, because don't forget, I wasn't the hacker that wasn't interested in making a dime. It was all about the the pursuit of knowledge, I never would have dreamed in a million years that I'd be where I am today based on my childhood hacking. Kevin's book, The Ghost in the Wires, My Adventures as the World's Most Wanted Hacker, is, of course, in hardcover from Little Brown. Also, though, on audible.com, uh, narrated by Ray, Ray Porter. I'm going to get that audible version of that because I like to listen. I wish you'd read it, though, Kevin. Yeah, I, I wish, too, but I, I was kind of disappointed. And by the way, I... Uh, People that actually solve the... Um, I'm getting to work the, on it right now. Brains. What? Uh, the people... Sorry, what'd you say? I'm going to get to work on it right now. Uh, the Now, I'll give you a clue. The odd chapters are a lot easier than the even chapters. Mm. Good, okay. Good but I wanted to today. say... What I want to say is um, the people that solve the cryptograms could uh, email me at mitnick at gmail.com. That's M-I-T-N-I-C-K at gmail.com. Or if they follow me on Twitter, I'm uh, uh, twitter.com slash Kevin Mitnick. They can, they can you know, just reply. Uh, and what I'll do is if they do, do solve all the cryptograms, I'll just drop their name into a hat. And maybe if you're willing to do it, Leo, we could draw uh, the names out of the hat on your show. Let's I'd do it on the show. air. Then yeah, there'll be, be no question yes. of any shenanigans. <laughs> exactly. Let's do it on your show. We'll do I it mean, live. You brought me back to the Internet eight years ago. Why not? be able to give out some memorabilia on your show. I'd love Thank to do you, it. Thank you, Kevin. Well, we, we, next time you're in the Bay Area, you tell us and we will do it. Uh, uh, I'm just proud to call you a friend. You're a great guy. We've always, we've always, I just have always had thought the world of you. Uh, and by the way, Steve Gibbs, people keep saying, we've got to get him on Steve on security now. Steve Gibbs is standing right across, our security guy, standing right across the hall and loving every minute of what you're talking about. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I hi, have Steve. A, <laughs> 
<laughs> he says hi. Kevin Mitnick. <laughs> just, just uh, you know, we've always had so much fun with you, Kevin. I know that you don't have a mean bone in your body. You just have a love uh, for a technology and a sense of exploration and a sense of fun. I'll tell you, you remind me so much of Waz. I know why you guys get along so well together. Uh, and it's, and uh, it's just great to talk to you. Yeah, it's fantastic to be on your show, Leo. It's, it's a pleasure always, and I'd, I'd love to uh, come up there in studio one of these days. It would, be, it would it'd really bring back memories of the old uh, screensavers days. I think you would think so. If you, if you came here and you saw it, it really does feel like the screensavers, and I'd just love to see you. We'll let you use a computer. Get on the Internet. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> as long as I get to use your Internet connection. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, no, Steve, my, my, my counselor's saying no. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Great to talk I to you. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Take great care. Talking to you, Kevin Mitnick, the book once again. One more plug. Ghost in the Wires. My Adventures is the world's most wanted hacker. He was, in fact, number one on the FBI's most wanted list for computer crime uh, for a very long time. They finally caught up with him. I bought a free Kevin sticker at Fringewear in 1998. Well, I'm sure you noticed, Texas. but when we were doing the screensavers, they'd taken the sticker that said, Free Kevin, cut it in half, and put Kevin free on the back of his computer. That's it for Triangulation. Uh, we do this show, news uh, events permitting, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. That's every Wednesday. Is next week, uh, David Allen? I'm very excited Ooh, about GTV. this. The uh, guy who created, you know, this is a, a methodology a lot of uh, us use to get things done. It really is the best uh, time management system going. I've interviewed David before. He's really a great interview. David Allen will join us getting things done next Wednesday, 5 p.m. Sorry, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. Tom Merritt, thank you for being here. Of course. Uh, once again, listen to TNT uh, every uh, Monday through Friday, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, uh, 21.30 UTC for the latest news. You had a big story today right at the end of TNT. Yeah, the breaking yeah, news. sharp Steve, eyes on Ayaz Akhtar. Yeah, thank you, Ayaz, for feed. catching that. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs resigning as CEO of Apple, taking a position as chairman of the board but letting Tim Cook take over day-to-day -day operation uh, of Apple Computer. So that was the big news story of the day. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time on Triangulation.